Thief of Baghdad was released at Christmas in 1940. Starring Sabu, a young Indian actor who had risen from obscurity to international stardom, the film has enchanted generations of cinema goers. And yet his real life story is as extraordinary as any movie fantasy. Sabu, as legend has it, was born under a banyan tree in the jungle outside the city of Mysore in southern India. He was discovered by the cameraman Osman Borodale during filming for Alexander Corder's production Elephant Boy, directed by Robert Flaherty. My attention was drawn to a young boy who entered the compound and ran to the office. I learned that his father had been a Mahout who had died in the service of His Highness the Maharaja, and that he, the boy, was there at the stables to collect his father's pension in the form of food for the family. He had his mother and an older brother who drove a taxi cab. He thought he was nine years old, did not attend school, and had no job. I was attracted by the boy's fine physique and graceful movement. His alert eyes and ready smile, together with his strong body, made him a most attractive little fellow. Strangely enough, Bob was not enthusiastic about the boy. He admired the strong little body, but he had hoped for a face with finer features. I was disappointed. Borodale was still anxious to help the boy and took him on as his personal servant. He was eager and hardworking and well-liked by the crew. Flaherty, who had been considering other boys for the role, eventually realized that it would be difficult to find a child who was as charming and spontaneous as Sabu. His tenacity and determination had finally won through. What had impressed most was his extraordinary skill with the elephants. The tricks he performed were a constant source of delight and amazement to everybody. Sabu became a movie star quite by accident. Previously, uh, Flaherty had made documentaries in remote parts of the world, in the Arctic, the South Seas, the far west of Ireland, and had used non-professionals in his sort of semi-documentaries he made. This was going to be a similar kind of film set in India about a relationship between a boy and an elephant. Originally, Corder had given Flaherty a free reign, but after more than a year of filming, it was clear to him that the production had run out of control. Be easy. Be easy now. Uh, Alexander Corder uh, sent out his brother Zoltan Corder to work on as a co-director. He sent out another director from an American director called Montebell, who was shooting material that was out of no value at all. So we have three people working on this picture, and Sabu in between, not knowing quite who he was working for. Flaherty had shot 55 hours of film with little reference to any script before Corder ordered the production back to England where things were taken in hand. A revised script was hastily cobbled together and Walter Hurd, a favorite actor of Corder's, was brought in for the new scenes which were shot at Denham Studios. As Sabu was needed for these reshoots, he was also brought over to England, accompanied by his elder brother, Sheikh. Had it not been for the chaotic conditions under which the elephant boy was made in India, Sabu would have, I think, still been working in the stables of uh, the Maharaja of uh, Mysore rather than coming back to Britain. After all, Flaherty's earlier heroes and heroines of um, Nanook of the North and Moana of the South Seas and Man of Aran remain sort of uh, uh, ad, ad f fishing in the Arctic and swimming in the South Seas and sort of chasing shark off the west coast of Ireland, where Sabu came back and became a star. He went to live in Beaconsfield with Osmond Borodale and his wife Christiane, where he was enrolled in a private school for foreign boys. Here he soon became fluent in English. It was a conventional prep school education, which quickly accustomed him to the rituals of English life. In 
And it has to be said, of course, that in those days of very strongly existent colour bar in Britain, the people who transcended that were people who had some position of aristocracy. And it is quite clear that in the sort of uh, the way in which um, Sabu moved in society with Corder, who was a great friend of uh, Winston Church and other, other people like this, he was presented as, given the image off screen, as being a sort of uh, Indian prince. He was always dressed in, sort of in, as it were, costume. He was accompanied by people who looked like servants, bodyguards, bearers, as if they were in attendance to him. I had to get yours, too. You must get terribly hot and thirsty working under all these lights. And you seem to be pretty hard at it when I was watching you just now. I don't suppose you often get time even for a short rest like this, do you? Oh, we nearly always have a break for tea. I see. Everything stops for tea, as the song says. But you'll have to be back on the set soon. At the studios, he learned to enjoy the trappings of stardom. Zoltan Korda presented him with a miniature car, which started a lifelong obsession with speed. Another of my delightful recollections of him is our flight to Paris for the premiere of Elephant Boy. Sabu had never been in a plane and was both excited and nervous. He was given a reception in Paris after his premiere by the young French actors. There again, I could admire his poise among city children whose language he did not know. There was no sign of shyness, but a solid self-assurance which made him answer the endless questions asked him with clarity and intelligence. Sabu captured the hearts of all who came in contact with him, and it was largely his popularity that made Elephant Boy such a huge success. It also made an overnight star of Sabu in this great era of child stars when Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland and Shelley Temple and Freddie Bartholomew were reigning supreme, the biggest stars in the world in the late Depression time. They were joined in this sort of juvenile consolation by this young Indian. Sabu's next film was to take him on a publicity trip to America. Again, he was given star treatment, and he toured the country meeting all sorts of stars and personalities, including the baseball hero Babe Ruth. He even visited President Roosevelt at the White House. The Drum, Sabu's second film, belonged to a cycle of movies about the imperial adventure that were being made both in Britain, mostly by Corder, and in America, which were concerned with supporting the empire and bringing together the English-speaking peoples and their colonies in the face of uh, fascism and Nazism. <laughs> Azim, the son of the Khan. My father has sent me to greet you, but please don't judge the warmth of his welcome by the size of his messenger. I'd measure it by the breadth of his smile. If we hadn't been shot at, Prince Azim. But you'll find that in the Wood Imperial movies, uh, that there are no major roles for Indian actors. Invariably, the characters, good or bad, are played by British and Americans in. Uh, heavy makeup and affecting sort of some slight oriental accents, like Raymond Massey, who had a particular speciality, playing sort of wily pathans and stories of the northwest frontier. Are these troops your escort, Captain Carruthers, or an army of occupation? They are. I promise, Your Highness, that my government will fulfill the treaty to protect your country against its enemies. Now I understand. Would Your Highness do me the honor to inspect the troops? It is a privilege to inspect the forces of the Raj. The drum was a good deal less jingoistic than a good many of the films being made at that time in England, but it went down very badly in India, where there were riots, um, the, the cinemas were picketed, and in a number of states, the film was either banned outright or severely cut.
Sabu's film may have caused controversy in India, and yet he was the only Indian actor ever to have achieved international fame. By now, Korda was considered the most important film magnate outside Hollywood. At Denham Studios, he presided in flamboyant style over a vast filmmaking empire, to which he brought the best technicians and filmmakers from around the world. That was the heyday of Korda, that was Korda's big days, and Denham in those days was a fabulous place. I mean, there was every star, you name it, that came over and was working, and there were so many famous people there sitting around the tables. It was like a like an exhibition of stars, you know. It was like a Hollywood in miniature in those days. It was wonderful. It was not just a British cinema, it was an international cinema that he created, that his stars were Conrad Veidt and Sabu. He said he could only make expensive movies, and he had this big program of major films, not cheap quota quickies. I had an agent that came in from America and he suddenly said one day, you've got to go out to Denver Studios. Uh, they want you to test for this new picture they're making there. You know, so. And we went on to stage A, which was as big as an aircraft hangar, and it was black. There was a boat on a rostrum about well, 20 yards away. And in the boat was a little brown boy. Out of it popped this chap, and it was like a, it was like a little devil out of somewhere. Wonderful smile, a most beautiful body. He was very warm, friendly and nice, and they, they left me with him, uh, telling me now they're going to do this scene, which was him and me uh, escaping from the, the terrible master in a boat. And uh, we did a, a rehearsal of this. No, no, they, did, they, did, they didn't like that. They wanted me to do it. Uh, well, uh, you know, you, you want to enjoy it more, you know, you, you want to sort of stretch John, and I knew exactly what they meant. They wanted me to do a strip tease. And I, 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 would have, I really I would have walked out then and there, you know, at that, except, except for him. Sabu's laughing like her. He thought it was very funny. I want to be a and he soon melted me down, and I just relaxed and enjoyed it. And I had, I had a wonderful time, and we got to like each other more and more. Aunts and cousins by the baker's dozens drive their men to sea or highway robbery. I want to be a bandit, can't you? We were originally directed by a German director, and he did the first three months' work. He was a funny little man, and everything was in very big close up. Nothing moved, everything was very, very, very artistic, very good. He gets into this. So we have a little scene, and the scene is uh, a scene with three people in it, June, to Sabu, and me, and a donkey, and a bale of hay, and that's it. And we do that scene. When Alex came back after three months and saw what had been done, he said, is no f bloody good, he said, and walked out. Well, we started all over again. He abolished all that, and we started again. And the scene that we'd played with Sabu, June, and I, this little tiny thing like that, was the whole of stage A. And we had the same script we had for the other scene. So, of course, this was about 150 yards down there. So after I'd walked about five, ten yards, we ran out of pages, and nothing there to read. So, <laughs> so why were you cut? What happened? Why you... No script. <laughs> what? So stop, everything stopped. And that was right then. So you have 500 extras, thousands of pounds worth of goods, <laughs> nothing to shoot. So we had to get some more script until we could have our script to take it through the, all this enormous thing. Give me one. Well, you are cool. Who ever heard of eating pancakes without honey? But how can you steal honey? Allah give us the pancakes and he will provide honey. Honey! One day, we got an order from the head office. Would we all go and have coffee with Alex? And then over the radio came the announcement of the war from our prime minister, which ended with the words, therefore we are now at war with Germany. Situation and we were all uh, fairly badly shaken. 
that and because of the war then reaching that point, we couldn't go to uh, where we were going, which was the Atlas Mountains in Africa. So instead we went to Hollywood and we did it in the Grand Canyon, which is quite a place, lots of rocks and long drops. It's <laughs> very hot, <laughs> indeed. The principal cast, including Sabu and his brother Sheikh, left for Hollywood where Corder had set up his new center of operations. The film was finished in time for Christmas. I remember vividly seeing The Thief of Baghdad. I was about seven at the time. The curtains part and this glorious, it was always called glorious Technicolor in those days, the, this vision transported you to another world. The young actor Sabu, with whom one, one could identify, one was taken completely away from the world outside, the world of rationing, of blackout, the continuing threat of invasion. Conrad Veidt's portrayal of the demonic dictator must have struck home with wartime audiences. And the significance of the hero's struggle against the forces of evil would not have been lost on them. Some people think the movie's silly, but at the very beginning of Thief of Baghdad, it says this is an Arabian fantasy. In other words, suspend your belief. And today, I probably would be laughed off the screen. We're much more jaded now. Uh, but at that a little simpler time back in 1939, and the movie really came together and clicked. Why have you come? To find you. Searching. From the beginning of time. Now that you found me, how long will you stay? Till the end of time. The dream. I feel in a way it would have been more popular in this country, or more remembered, if it had had American stars like Humphrey Bogart or Errol Flynn or Rita Hayworth or something like that. But thank God it doesn't. Uh, Sabu had, of course, been known for two films. But I think somehow the fact that uh, you had not American stars in, I think, gave it a sort of an other world quality that it helps make it timeless. I used to think that John Justin wasn't too good at it. He's rather vapid, lovesick prince, uh, not quite believable. But you know what they really did? They took the old Fairbanks version and divided it. They gave Sabu the action part and John Justin, you might say, the love part. And I think it worked uh, very effectively. There's a tremendous direct sincerity about his for his performances as compared with the rather sort of, uh, sort of calculated performance that you get from Shirley Temple, uh, Ed, almost superior to the adults, or Mickey Rooney, who had come out of a tradition of uh, vaudeville, who was, sort of a, who was always kind of on stage. There's something really d direct unaffected and deeply sincere, an old-fashioned word that one would think about Sabu. Sabu was a star not only from her first movie, but for, uh, I'd say, practically a 10 or 12 year period. And like I say, I've talked to some friends about this. It's practically impossible to name another star who, without some prior type of experience, started at the top. So I think that makes uh, Sabu's career uh, relatively unique. The background for meeting Sabu was my father worked for Alexander Korda. And Sabu, turned out, was about the same age as I was and didn't really have any friends his own age. So he um, made arrangements for us to meet, and the best time it turned out to be was the time of a sneak preview done on Thief of Baghdad just prior to the release. Sabu dropped by our house over in Studio City in his brand new 1940 Ford station wagon, dressed in white with a white turban. And I'll tell you, it was a stunning sight. <laughs> and my sister and I joined him, and we drove over to the studio, or to the uh, motion picture house in time for the, the preview. And it turned out that it was just a smash hit. 
Everybody was thrilled to death about that picture. By now, Sabu was known all over the world, and Corder was confident that his popularity alone would be enough to ensure box office success. Corder immediately embarked on another large-scale epic, an adaptation of Kipling's Jungle Book, which he created at a large compound outside Los Angeles. Many times, uh, I'd get a phone call, and it would be him asking if uh, I wanted to go to the jungle compound or go to the location set. And these were great times, because we'd hop in the, in the 40 Ford and take off and uh, go out there and meet the trainers. And at that time, he was getting familiar with the tiger that they were going to use for the close-up shots. His uh, relationship to the wolves was really something to behold. They took to him right away, and he took to them. And they used to walk along uh, in, the, in the pathways between the cages and things of this sort. They'd be out with him. The old corporal was right. First, they go mad. Sabu lived up to Corder's expectations and proved that he was indeed capable of carrying a film alone. The success of Jungle Book, his fourth film, held the promise of great things to come. Come back with us, said last. I'm of the jungle. Their lair is my lair. Their trail is my trail. Their fight is my fight. <laughs> He's no longer my son. He's a godling of the woods. Surprisingly, this film turned out to be his last with Corda, who was anxious to return to Britain and re-establish his film empire in his adopted country. Sabu, now 18, financially independent and well-established in Hollywood, felt his future lay in America. Yes, I was in Hollywood. Originally, I intended to return to England. But Hollywood's offer was too tenement to resist. I stayed on to make another picture. Then England went to war. At that time, I was still too young to fight. And there was no point in returning besides. My elder brother had married an American girl, and America had become home to us. In America, Sheikh took a much more active role in his brother's career and was a constant companion. As Sabu's manager, he accompanied him on all his publicity engagements and had considerable influence over his choice of film roles. Of course, I remember Sheikh because he was more or less the commanding officer of the operation. Um, he was Sabu's older brother, and uh, he managed the finances. And uh, uh, after he came out here with Sabu, I, uh, he married a, a very pretty girl, Betty Swing, and her father was uh, General Swing. Sheikh quickly adapted to the American way of life and also set up his own successful furniture business. Sabu, being much younger, had different interests. Sabu really liked engine-driven things. He enjoyed uh, uh, hot rods. He wanted to get into hot rods really in earnest, and did so. Now, at one time, on Sepulveda, Boulevard. They used to block off the road and run drags. And of course, uh, this was frowned upon by the officials, but for a long time they did this and they, nobody got hurt or anything of that sort or not. They had some narrow scrapes and things, but Sabu was involved in a lot of that. And we palled around as I, as we both got older, why uh, our, our things that we did changed and uh, lots of times we we would take out some gals together and things of this sort and there were always plenty of those for a movie actor in and around the studios it must have been an extraordinary change of um, living life whatever that here we here he was in the jungle an elephant boy and then very shortly after that he was a star you know and being a star in hollywood has a lot of uh, interest to it i mean he he was quite good looking, I thought, you know, and he was an attractive guy. And he's got all these gorgeous girls in Hollywood. And he must have, must have felt something like, you know, am I dreaming? This is such a change. 
these lovely girls from Elephants. <laughs> Well, I remember one time in the, when we were up at his house, which was on Mulholland Drive, where somebody brought up, what, what kind of money are you making to get all of these things and play around with all of this stuff? And the, 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 the amount of money that was mentioned was $750 a week. So you can imagine in 1940, $750 a week was a lot of money. By 1941, Sabu was earning even more. He had landed a lucrative contract with Universal Studios worth $1,000 a week. When Sabu came to Universal, most stars were not treated with red carpet. Uh, they would be treated uh, with great respect, of course, but they would be treated as a working professional, more than as some strange god that comes from another country. So Sabu came to this situation, which was a film factory situation. And the studio ran like a studio system always had run since the, 19, since the 1920s. And a boy being under 18, actually under 21, they had to go to school. It was the law and uh, still is to this day. And even someone like Sabu coming from another country would still be required to have some classes in the school. Sabu was to receive star billing alongside Maria Montes, who was immensely popular at the time. Known as the Queen of Technicolor, she was also famous for the highly risque, diaphanous costume she wore. Universal was having lots of trouble trying to find themselves at this time. Sabu was going to try to be a savior for them. And uh, of course, the pictures didn't do that badly. I don't want to say that they, they were flops or anything. They were bread and butter pictures. That They didn't want them to be just that. They wanted them to be big hits and to put them on the A-list. But it didn't work out that way. A lot of people sort of laugh at Sabu's Universal movies, you know, Arabian Nights, Cobra Woman, White Savage, and they are sort of camp. In fact, Cobra Woman is high camp, but they filled a real need at the time. There again, a never-never land of a South Sea island with a volcano that would get off, go off whenever uh, it was necessary for it to do so. These scripts were sort of stupid. Uh, Maria Montez would uh, swish around and uh, uh, John Hall was the big muscular hero, and there again, Sabu was the sidekick. They were called sort of Easterns, and many of them did have plots that were rather like Western movies. They enjoyed a certain popularity, but they certainly didn't enjoy anything in the way of critical esteem, and indeed, for the most part, they were not shown to critics. The idea, you can almost hear the producers thinking, in which they're trying to combine all the elements of Tarzan pictures, uh, fantasy like pictures like Thief of Baghdad of, of fantasy books into jungle pictures relating to animals and they would figure that would be the most perfect uh, combination to be, get a hit. Unfortunately they overproduced these pictures. And uh, this, again, was a part of the downfall of uh, the film and of Sabu, too, is that he was starting by accident, really, being relegated to being a co-star. He was starting to become the friend of, other, of, of the star <laughs> or the faithful friend of uh, the woman. He wouldn't get the woman. He would, of course, be her friend. I mean, this was the beginning of the end for, for an actor's leading role capabilities. America is attacked. America is attacked. G.I. Jungle of Wooden Planks doesn't phase Private First Class Dastagir. Recognize him under all that khaki? He's Sabu, the jungle boy of the movie. Now a Private First Class in the Army Air Forces checked in with several hundred other students at the Harlingen Army Airfield Tuesday minus pachyderms, but with an earnest He had ambition. all of the opportunity of the world as any other person in Hollywood with all the pull that Hollywood had to keep him from being anywhere near any danger in the war. And he could have sat it out, and there was a, a almost a legendary uh, thing said in those days. If you were in Hollywood and an actor or a, uh, some sort of a functionary in Hollywood, you could join the Hollywood Navy, which was the Coast Guard, and never get beyond San Pedro Bay. Sabu, the elephant boy, is in the Army Air Force now. His contract with Universal had six years to run, but he hopes to spend his time flying. Well, it's no small thing to volunteer to become an air crew in a B-24. To be a belly gunner is certainly not uh, jealously <laughs> gone for. Um, actually, you're crowded, you're cramped, you're inside of a thing where you're almost with your knees up under your chin, and you're there for hours. 
I understand that uh, he was lucky he was small enough to be able to take a parachute in there with him. He was cited for meritorious achievement while participating in aerial flights in the Southwest Pacific area from October 16, 1944 to November 26, 1944. Your brother took part in sustained operational flight missions during which hostile contact was probable and expected. These flights included bombing missions against enemy installations, shipping and supply bases, and aided considerably in the recent successes in this theater. Wearing the ribbons of the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters, two presidential unicitations, and six battle stars. Sabu, let me tell you something in front of all our friends. Every American should be very proud of you. Thank you, Jimmy. And there is a, there's no place as great as America. All right, you are. But when he came back, things had changed somewhat. This, uh, and uh, his next picture, I think, Tangier, was black and white. Again, he was the sidekick. Um, the Arabian-type fantasies tended to go out of uh, style, you might say. I think he had a trouble adapting to the, the new Hollywood, the new film noir, or the new realism that pervaded uh, uh, Hollywood at the time. And Sabu, who was an A star at one time, couldn't help it. I mean, when you're being put in a B studio, more or less, with B actors in a B movie, which they didn't think was B, but anyway, he went into this kind of thing thinking that it would help his career, and in a way, it kind of stereotyped him into this kind of uh, exotic boy kind of a figure. I mean, it would easily have ended his career by the 1950s. I mean, where are you going to cast Sabu? Well, who would want to cast him? There was no question, but that after his involvement with Corda, it was a great dip in his career to go to Universal and make these Maria Montez movies. And I, Ed, it is obvious that when he received the invitation to come back to England to appear in Black Narcissus with Michael Powell, then the most highly regarded director working in Britain, was a major upturn in his career. My memory of him was... Um on the film Black Narcissus, which I photographed. And um, he was then a very handsome royal prince in his dazzling clothes, and he had quite a regal bearing, and he, I thought he was marvellous. But Ruma Garden, whose novel the film was based on, was not at all impressed by Sabu. She thought him totally miscast as a young Rajput prince and described him as a thick-set, snub-nosed South Indian coolie boy. I suppose if you live a long time in, in places like India, there is a, a, rather, a rather sort of um, slightly snobbish feeling about lower castes and things. But if Sabu was um, a southern Indian, um, I certainly wasn't aware of it. I mean, to me, and certainly most people who saw the film, he was an Indian prince. He looked every bit of it, I thought. He had this terrific partnership with Jean Simmons, who was then 18, and she was absolutely beautiful, very exotically beautiful and uh, I thought it was a very excellent bit of casting. Michael Powell, um, he was very kind to me, but he could be very, very uh, tough with a lot of people. You know, he had this rather sneering voice sometimes, and he'd say to an actor, you're not very good, are you? No, and oh, and we were all going, oh dear, <laughs> and he was pulling them to pieces. But I think, if I remember right, that with Sabu, he was rather like a, an avuncular kind of uh, manner with him, or a father, and he, he used to treat him uh, very kindly, in fact. I think he liked him a lot. Michael Powell, in his autobiography, says, it was a part tailor-made for Sabu, and he was proud to be in it. As for me, I was delighted to help my little friend. I didn't look on Sabu as an exotic, as so many people did, an Indian boy from the Maharaja's elephant stable who had become a film actor. Uh, Sabu was much more than that. Do you like it, Sister Ruth? It's called Black Narcissus. Comes from the Army Navy stores in London. Black Narcissus. I don't like scent at all. Oh, Sister, don't you think it's rather common to smell of ourselves? This uh, film about nuns in the Himalayas, made entirely in a very stylized way in a British studio, I think one of Michael Powell's masterpieces, uh, it can be seen now as, as a little story, allegory, about the end of empire and the British withdrawal, the handing over to 
uh, to the Indians of responsibility. So he took part, in a sense, in sort of a film which we could now see historically as heralding, or indeed marking, the end of empire. He then remained in England to work for Powell and Pressburger's company, The Archers, but in a film called The End of the River, in which he plays uh, an Indian boy from the Amazon basin who has, comes into uh, contact with Western society and is destroyed by his experience. Fifteen will race the bottle of the brothers Roger. No one brother could conceive this. Smell it, my friend. Smell it, my lady. Beautiful. As I have the bottle open, I will let you have a sample. Here is the coal. The lady will hold the mirror for you. Do you really like it? I never had a fine thing like that on my hair. Cheek, eh? Unluckily for Sabu, this movie turned out to be a failure at the box office. He returned to Hollywood and, no longer with a studio contract, appeared in independently produced movies. In 1948, he made Song of India. I think you might say that for one time in my life, I was starstruck. <laughs> because when I was a little girl, I really didn't care for the movies. But I went to see Elephant Boy. And from that time on, Sabu was my hero. The um, producer of Song of India called me and they asked me to come down to the studio. And so I said I would. And I went down there and they <coughs> walked into, this, into the office and they said, oh, she's perfect. And so uh, I still didn't know what I was doing. So they took me into the makeup room and started putting makeup on me. And uh, the door opened and in walked Savu. And I, I, <laughs> my heart just beat so fast. And he, uh, uh, he told me that he was, we were going to work together, that uh, Gail Russell had become ill and that I was going to take her place. I didn't believe I should go out with him while, while we're filming the picture. So um, we had a lot of fun on the set, but I didn't go out with him. But then when we started dating, and that, then he started asking me to marry him. And uh, I kept saying no <laughs> for three whole months. <laughs> Sabu, the little Indian actor, was married yesterday to Marilyn Cooper, a bit player in his picture, Song of India. Sabu, who is just 25, and the pretty little girl whom he has known two and a half months, were united in marriage at the Encino Episcopal Church. Sabu had a home in uh, Chatsworth, and it was on a lake, five acres, and it was just beautiful. And we had a great big gate as you got just at the outside of the, uh, the road, and we kept that. When he came home, we'd close the gate, and that would be... We had our own little palace and our own little uh, town right there. <laughs> we had a wonderful life together. Sabu was a wonderful husband. He was romantic and exciting and he did everything. There was never a time when he was down. He always kept your life real happy. Because of all of the times that we used to pal around and all of the, all of the gals that we'd taken out and everything like that, he kind of took a, an occasion to tell me that all that was past because he said that when he met Marilyn, that was just about the end of wanting to be with anyone else but her. They struck me as being soulmates. And he always involved me in his work. Whenever he was doing anything, we did it together. And then, of course, uh, when the children came, uh, uh, our lives certainly changed. He was very much a father. He loved his family, loved his children, and he had all kinds of things planned for them. During this period, he was having to fight a succession of lawsuits brought against him, including a paternity claim, perhaps the price he had to pay for his Hollywood fame. What happened to me shouldn't even happen to a dog, he is quoted as saying. He was judged innocent in every case, but the final indignity came when his house was burned down. It was mentioned that maybe somebody that was disgruntled about that paternity suit had torched the place when they were gone, and the police figured somebody had torched it, and they were accusing Sabu of doing it. However, uh, he hadn't done anything like that, and he wouldn't have done anything like that because he loved the house. He was judged innocent yet again, and though he was now able to rebuild his home, a chance to escape from it all for a while must have appeared attractive. He got an offer from Tom Arnold, who was forming a circus in England, and it was supposed to be all the very finest uh, circus acts in the world were to get together. 
And so he accepted that assignment, and we went over to England. When he got there, they brought different elephants from different acts, and they hadn't worked together. So when they put them together, they started a fight. So they had to work and work to get them all settled down and get into an act. And he'd come home at night, and he'd be so disgusted. He'd say, those elephants, he said, they just wouldn't do right. you know. But finally, they got them together and got them going. And they put the music to it, and the, every elephant went in a different direction. And he had a beautiful costume. It was like a Thief of Baghdad costume with a red vest and the white uh, uh, jodhpurs and, and the turban and all. And, and he just really looked handsome, you know. Well, it just didn't go over. And they were wondering why. And the audience didn't want him that way. They wanted him in, in his doity. So he had to do the rest of the circus acts uh, the rest of the time in a doity, freezing all the time because it was midwinter. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said he just couldn't win. <laughs> the circus act was so successful that the family ended up touring in Europe, mostly in Germany, France, and Holland, for three years. He was so popular. I, I didn't realize how popular he was. They'd just come from all over to see him. Whilst in Italy, Sabu made the film Buongiorno Elefante with Vittorio De Sica, and then returned briefly to work in India his first visit there since leaving as a child. They all greeted him wonderfully, and, and he enjoyed being there. But he told me at the time, he said, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my home, but he said, it's not my home. He said, America's my home. And I don't know of anyone that was more American than Sabu. He never talked to either my brother nor I about his life in India too much. He was, uh, he was an American, and he wanted to raise us as Americans, and he never taught us Hindi. He didn't talk too much about his past. He, I don't think he lived in the past very much. I think he was always looking into the future. Sabu's only link with his childhood past was Sheikh, though by now the two brothers had begun to drift apart. I think Sabu's relationship kind of deteriorated with respect to Sheikh because Sheikh was more or less the boss and Sabu outgrew that. And so they ultimately, I believe, parted the ways. Tragically, Sheikh was to become the victim of an attack by one of his own employees who robbed him of the payroll he was carrying. We don't know what happened, but uh, he, uh, Sheikh was shot and he died. And it was, it was a shock to Sabu, you know, to, think that the one person that he'd been with all these years and the thing was gone. Sabu didn't feel like working after the tragedy. In an interview, he said, it took me a long time to get over it. My brother and I were very close and the whole thing was so senseless. Hollywood didn't want Sabu to grow up. And uh, he had really had a problem with that. And the, the pictures they offered him, you know, they, they just weren't what he wanted. And uh, he wanted to be able to grow up and be an actor. Part of the, the problem with this uh, losing of this romantic lead or starring roles of such actors is that the, the actors that had, who were short, like Mickey Rooney, who uh, could not outgrow being a child, they, uh, once they grew up to adulthood, they were still five foot three inches. Thus, their capability of being the romantic lead was lost. I was producing a lot of pictures for Republic Pictures at that time. But I had a great story for Cebu. It was called Jaguar. I was originally going to call it Piranha because it had to do with the Piranha fish that are so dangerous. But we changed the title to Jaguar. Sabu read the script. He liked it very much. We were off to the races, and we made this picture called Jaguar. <laughs> It was not a big money maker, and it certainly was below the dignity of Cebu having done all of these great Corda pictures. But things had changed for Cebu. He was no longer the 14-year-old boy. He was now the 27, 28. 
your old man. And uh, for him to have a real love interest uh, might not have gone over so well at that time, to be quite truthful. People like Sabu, uh, who were of an ethnic quality, they, of course, were limited in, in not only being young and looking old and all of this aspect, but also being of a, of a minority group, which in the United States at the time was not looked particularly at being a major star. Uh, especially with blacks too. During uh, during the war, there were very few black stars. I mean, there hardly any at all. And and if there were any, they played for black audiences only. It's just that basically you want to see Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford making love. Sabu, I think he perhaps one of the millstones around his neck was Elephant Boy. They associate all his life he was associated with elephants, and I think that probably grew to haunt him. Why don't they say what they mean? There's no place in the university for savages. But you are wrong. They think I'm still in the cage. Where are you going? Back to the jungle where I belong. Uh, Zabu was very, a very practical person. And he, he looked ahead to take care of his family. And he knew that, you know, particularly when he couldn't get the type of pictures he wanted, that he should go into some other kind of business. So he did. He went into uh, contracting. We owned eight apartment buildings. He was a very astute, very smart man. Sabu accepted the realities of Hollywood, and his fulfilling home life went a long way towards compensating for the disappointing roles which were now being offered him. When people ask me about my father, they only remember him for the, you know, earlier films that he made when he was a, uh, a child and, and they're, you know, a teenager. Um, and, those were classics, but he, he did uh, have an amount of uh, um, other things to his life. He was making films up to uh, the very time he died. In the 60s, Asabu made uh, Mistress of the World for Germany, and then he made Rampage for uh, Warner Brothers, and then he made uh, Tiger Walk for Disney. And then we had just signed for, a, he had just signed for a picture in Spain. And he had gone to the doctor for a physical. And the doctor kind of hit him on the shoulder, you know, after physical. And he says, if everyone was as healthy as you, he said, I'd be out of business. And two days later, Sabu died. He died in my arms. Sabu, famed elephant boy of the movies, died yesterday of a heart attack at his home. He was 39. I feel that my parents were always very much in love. It was not these terrible tales of Hollywood that you hear. There was always a tremendous amount of love in my family. And uh, when my father died, he left a terrible hole in our family, and it's still there. For some reason, I think my dad had a gift of, of, of uh, making people believe that they could be that person. And uh, he, uh, he just let everybody live out the fantasy that he had the, in, his, in his movies. It's very funny, in all my life, which is now a very long one, I don't remember things very well. And I don't awfully remember individual people. And he shines out like a, 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 a diamond, you know, just the fact of him.